Is Christina there? There are three Christinas. Oh, well. Um, I get them all mixed up anyway. Um, so should we start? Yes, I suppose. If yes, we can. Oh, wow, we have quite a few people here. Okay. Oh, I feel much better now. <coughs> okay, so uh, let's start. Um, and uh, well, welcome to the first conversation of anthropology for the current academic year. Uh, it went fairly well last year, hopefully this year uh, improved and, and uh, we're starting off with a wonderful guest, uh, Professor Carlo Cubero. And uh, his talk is titled Transinsularism, a Caribbean Perspective. Um, this is also being, I need to tell you, being recorded. So in case you don't want uh, to be visually present, uh, please uh, check out the, the, uh, the, the screen and put a line through it. Um, and also please try and mute yourself if there's noise in the background. Okay. So just to let you know, this is being recorded. Um, Carlo Cabrera received his PhD in social anthropology and visual media from the University of Manchester. He is currently an associate professor of anthropology at Tallinn University in Estonia, and he coordinates the graduate program in social anthropology and audiovisual ethnography. One strand of his research focuses on audiovisual methods for conducting anthropological research. He has made numerous documentaries and uh, quote unquote sound works. In his award winning documentary titled Mangrove Music, he followed two music groups from the island of Culebra. I, is that how you pronounce it? Culebra? Culebra? Carlo? Yes, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, either either pronunciations. It's okay. fine. But to look at processes and relationships that enable the formation of an island musical identity. Another strand of his research involves the historical ethnographic study of, in his words, the complexities of Caribbean island life in a paracolonial and global context. To expand on the second strand, in one of his articles, Carlo, if I may say, uh, writes about the history of Flamengo Beach in Culebra. The beach was used for bombing practice by the US until 1975 when they left, but did not, did not clean up after themselves. Now the beach is the main tourist attraction of the island, drawing as many as 12,000 visitors in a weekend. As a tourist destination, the beach has drawn many different kinds of people to its shore. Among them, developers, surfers, ecological tourists, and of course, the rich who have uh, built uh, magnificent villas along the waterfront. And of course, it drew Carlo. Carlo portrays the beach as being in motion over time, continually changing its identity. These changes are accompanied by or the result of, quote, unexploded ordinances, radioactivity, marine life, nature lovers, tourists, military infrastructure, environmental activists, hotels, and luxury villas, all coexisting along one beachfront. Carlo historicizes the island by attending to the traces of the past that remain evident in the present. He begins one of his articles by providing an eloquent description of how anthropologists first experience uh, going into their field site. He writes, uh, and I quote, the arrival moment offers a kind of knowledge that is untapped, latent, and waiting to be narrativized. It creates a felt impression and a sense of things that may or may not come. And when I read this, I, I just felt that's captured exactly how I felt when I first went uh, to Sri Lanka. I find it to be a wonderfully eloquent passage on, on how anthropologists tend to experience their moment, uh, their, their arrival to a field site. But now we have also arrived at this Zoom juncture 
and I hope we can all engage expectantly into the layered narrativized knowledge we are about to be served by Professor Cabero. After the talk, we will have a Q&A uh, session. So if you have questions, you can write them down in chat, either on Facebook or on uh, the, the current website, the Zoom website, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take the questions in order uh, that we receive them. So Carlo, you're on stage. Okay, cheers. Well, Victor, a, many thanks for that very generous um, um, introduction. Um, the the article that you were a, that Victor was was referring to um, is available for download. If anybody wants to follow <laughs> follow this up, um, you know I have an academia.edu page, so you can search for me there. I have an account there, and um, the that that paper that a Victor was a, referring to is I'm going to type here it's, it's a chapter in a in a book that is called ruptures so I think it's ruptured landscapes or something or making sense of a demilitarized beach that's the the paper yeah and I was very inspired by <clears throat> sorry Mary Louise's Pratt take on the arrival scene of the anthropologists mm -hmm. and uh, yeah and uh, I was I was riffing off from that but yeah thanks Thanks for that introduction and thank you for the invitation, Victor, sure. to come. Yeah, to come here um, and share my, my my research with you. I'm very happy that you all came up, came here. I want to um, I want to mention some some names that I reckon Eva Villalon. We did our undergraduate together in Puerto Rico many 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 moons ago, and we also coincided in, in Manchester. Yeah, very nice, very nice to see you guys. And thank thank you the rest for for coming. I hope. I hope I won't disappoint it or it, it too much. So my, um, uh, the title of the talk is uh, Transinsularism. Transinsularism, Transinsularism from a Caribbean perspective. Transinsularism is a, is a concept that I developed in my, in my PhD work and it forms, and it's the core concept of my book. Wanna write, put it here, anybody's interested in the <laughs> look, Caribbean <laughs> Island Movements. Um, it is it is the book and I'll, and I have a link here. Uh, excuse me, from the Amazon page. The book has been getting very nice reviews. I must say, anybody wants to uh, follow it up. Um, some of the chapters are available in the Academia.edu page or have been published in other in, in other parts. But the book puts it all uh, together into a coherent piece. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking, um, I was informed by Victor that this is more of a conversation and informal setting. So I, will, it's, I don't have like a lecture uh, prepared, but rather I have some, some notes um, that I want to share with you. And it's more, I guess I'll just share with you how I came to, to visit Culebra, how I developed an interest on the island, um, what were some of the events and activities that I, that I observed, and then hopefully make a... Um, and by the end, I'll be making a case. What do I mean by transinsularism? And of course, in the Q and A, we can I can we can develop more. What um, what are the implications and possibilities for transinsular research? All right. So I'll start with a map to get ourselves oriented. Share screen. Oh, uh, share Google Maps. Um, uh, Victor, can you give me a thumbs up if it's up? Yeah, you all can see that. Okay, very good. Sweet. So the Caribbean archipelago, right, needs no introduction. Um, the islands are arranged neatly in a row. Um, it's a tectonic plate that is separating, right? And, and so the, um, the islands emerge from, from the ocean. Most of the islands in the Lesser Antilles are, are volcanoes, so the island of Montserrat, over here, it's an active, it's an active volcano still, still okay. So, okay, so the um, out, um, Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, they usually are, are labeled as the Greater Antilles. Um, the islands on the east, they're, they're labeled the Lesser, the Lesser Antilles. And in between the Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles, this cluster of islands, Google Maps labels it as British Virgin Islands and US Virgin Islands. Um, Google Maps has its funny way of naming things. In, in, in nautical charts, the entire cluster of islands is called the Virgin Islands, the Virgin Islands. This distinction between British Virgin Islands and US Virgin Islands 
is um is a political distinction in that and well i'll be developing a little this a little bit later how the archipelago is divided into political regions but by british virgin islands it's a, it's the cluster of islands that is currently under the sovereignty of the queen and us virgin islands um they are a non incorporated territory of the united states similar to a uh, puerto rico but they have a different they have a different arrangement and they're different jurisdictions all right, so um, the, so I was I'm from San Juan over here, the capital of of, of Puerto Rico. It's the cap is the largest city of of of, of the island. Um, the combined population of the entire metropolitan area is around one million one million people. At least it used to be before I left. Um, and so what the picture that I want to offer you, you it's a it's a very dense urban space, and I want to start with that. Um, that it's um, it's a very dense urban space, a mainly populated, loads of cars, lots of lots of lots of, lots of traffic. And when I was a, a teenager, I was uh, I well, in in my household, I developed we I developed an interest in 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 snorkeling, in scuba diving, camping, nature tourism. Um, I was a tour guide for a bit in the national park here. It's called a Junque. Um, my mother was a bit nature enthusiast, and we would always look for, you know, weekends, places to go for for for, for weekend tourism. Um, <clears throat> Culebra, locate is Culebra is one of the Virgin Islands in not not politically, but in nautical charts. It is always described. So we have here the entire Virgin Islands: Culebra, Vieques, uh, Saint Croix, Saint Thomas, Saint John, Just Van Dyke, Tortola, Uringorda. These are the 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 Virgin the Virgin Islands. The Virgin Islands are divided into three jurisdictions, British Virgin Islands, US Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Whatever and Vieques are part of, are part of, of the Puerto Rican uh, uh, jurisdiction. All right. So um, Culebra was always a site of, um, of interest uh, for in, in, in my household. We had this, there was this, um, um, the, the island is consistently described as uh, underdeveloped, um, in terms of its of its infrastructure, um, it is one of the. It's consistently described as one of the poorest parts of the of poorest municipalities of, of, of Puerto Rico. Whenever there's some kind of a let's say natural disaster, a hurricane or an earthquake, Culebra, Culebra and Vieques are particularly hit hard because it's one of the last places to receive to receive aid. And there's this recurrent there's this recurrent narrative of Culebra being an isolated place being isolated, being alienated, being marginals, peripheral to the Puerto Rican project. Um, part, of this, part of this imagery of the island being peripheral and marginalized, is this, there's this images, some of you may be Googling now Culebra just to get some your uh, ideas of it. You see uh, you, uh, the images that come up is of, of an underpopulated place, lots of um, low grasslands, Beautiful beaches, um, and it's a it's a as as Victor was saying earlier, it's an active tourist a, a location. But when my mother and I we started, and my brother when we started going there in the eighties and nineties for, for for camping, the 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 island was a popular destination place for scuba enthusiasts, um, snorkeling, underwater sports. A, there's a there's a bay here on the I'm zooming in. I hope the zoom works out. this the inside bay of the of this of the of the island um, the water is very calm there making it very appropriate for water skiing a uh, you know sailing the north part of the island is very popular for, with with surfers um there's an ex extraordinary abundance of marine life dolphins whales pass by there for for migrating um uh, leatherback turtles, hawksbill turtles lay eggs along the, 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 the north coast of the island. So the image that I want, it was, it was a very um, a pop, a attractive site for my, my household, my family, who were interested in, in these kinds of, like, of, 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 of na nature, nature activities. So I, throughout my teenage years, I developed a personal relationship. I, mean, I didn't know anybody on the island, but I would do, um, we would go, yeah, every summer, every Easter, long, long weekends. Now, the way the way to get to Culebra was um, from 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 San Juan, 
right? You take, you take your, your drive, your car to the Eastern city of Fajardo. And from here, you take a ferry that is administered by the state, by the Puerto Rican state, Puerto Rican Port, Port Authority. And the trip, the trip will last depending on the, on the conditions of the sea. It could take anything, anywhere from 90 minutes, two hours, to up to four to six hours, depending on the conditions and the load, the load that the that the that the boat that the boat had. All right. So um, I go into my my under. I start doing my undergraduate degree already. An enthusiast of of Culebra, um, for its for its natural uh, for its nature nature tourism. Upon finishing my undergraduate degree at the University of Puerto Rico, I got a job on Culebra. As, um, as the coordinator of a, of a youth center. It's a, it's a long story how I ended up there, but let us just as a brief, a brief summary. Um, in 1989, Hurricane Hugo did a massive devastations to all the infrastructure on the island. And um, the island became the target of many NGOs and development agencies that were going there to assist, help recon the, the, the reconstruction. Amongst, the, amongst the, um, the NGOs that were building, there was this, uh, a, a Jesuit, you know, a Jesuit organization, but Jesuit order. And they built a youth center next to the, to the Catholic church. And they needed somebody to, to, to run it, or not just run it, but to function as a coordinator between the resources in San, getting resources in San Juan and, 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 and Culebra. So it was during this period that I, and I started, I lived on the island full time for, for two years. And it was during this period that I started developing a more ethnographic interest on the, on the, on, on the island. So during, during this time of living on, on the island, so to get, get our bearings of the general geography of the place. Um, so the main town, the main town is located on the south bit of the island here. The town is called Dewey, D-E, where's the chat? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get, we'll, I'll, I'll leave it for later. The main town is located here in the south of the island. The main residential areas are, there's two clusters. One is this, this batch here, and another, this and another, and this other batch. So the bulk of the population at that time was 3,000, 3,500 people. They live in this, in this clustered part of the island. This gray area you see here on top of the number 250, that's, 250, that's the airport. As the airport, the rest of the island that you see all this all this area here is is not is, is not developed. There are some, as Victor was saying, there are some sporadic houses, big beautiful villas and mansions spread out, but there's no of the, the in terms of organized uh, urban uh, living. It's all located down here on the south part of the of the of, of the island. So for during while I was working on the on the island for this um, NGO. I lived in town, in the main town, down here in the, in the center, in the, in the center of the island. Okay, so the main tourist, um, so I'm not very organized, I'm sorry, but the main tourist attractions on the island are located on the north, the north bits of the island, right? Um, Victor mentioned Flamenco Beach. This is the main tourist destination. It's a white sandy beach, white coral sand. Um, it's a very deep bay, as you can see. So this means that the water here is very calm. But the moment you get outside of the areas of the bay, it, the, the, the sea becomes very rough and it's very good areas for surfing. The same with the next island following, the next beach that's following, uh, Resaca and Brava. These are the three, the three main islands of the, of the three main beaches of the island. Like, oh, sorry. And then on the north, a western bit is Sony Beach, is the other main tourist attraction of the island. And then as for scuba diving, snorkeling, just all around the island, there's lots, there's lots of activities and stuff and, and, and stuff to do. Okay, so um, the book, the book that I that I'm, the book um, begins with my first observations of the or contradictions or tensions that I was observing while working for this for this NGO. And I want to uh, emphasize that this NGO that I had that gave me the mandate to, to develop this, this youth center on, on the island, they were based in the capital in San Juan. And a lot of their assumptions and, and issues that they took for granted were, 
were based on the perspective from the capital, from, from San Juan, not necessarily from the islanders, islanders' perspective. So <clears throat> the, the, the main theme that, that struck, that stood out for me, that, that was putting, that came under pressure during the years that I was living there initially, was this theme of the island as an isolated location. Um, this imagery of the island as separated, the opposite of the continent, on the margins, peripheral, homogeneous, socially conservative, um, isolated by the sea. You know, the sea, as we see by Google Maps, it's just empty expanse of, of blue. There's no history on the sea. There's no human activity on the sea, other activities on, on the land. So what I one of the I was very early on, I was observing instances that put pressure on this idea of the island as being isolated, homogenous, socially conservative, backward, poor, in need of administration from the, from, 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 from the mainland. And these observations, some of them were on the, on the theme of, 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 of isolation and homogeneity. One of the first things that any visitor would, um, would see on their arrival to Culebra is that the most of the, if not all, of the businesses that are located in the main town, they're not run by locals. They're not run, let's say, by Puerto Rican locals. But they, there's a very, it's a very heterogeneous community. Primary, uh, for the, the pizzeria is run by uh, an American couple. Next to the pizzeria is a Chinese restaurant run by um, Venezuelan born Hong Kong Chinese uh, 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 entrepreneurs. Um, the scuba shops are run by is run by a Swiss German couple. Their competitors is a Swiss French couple. <laughs> they have a two. There's two scuba shops on the island, um, the, and most of the um, uh, tourism shops are not run by local Culebra Islanders. A second theme that that I highlight in the book that also struck me when I arrived to Culebra is that when you go when, when you go to the into the to the bay of the island, um, I'm not sure if I put it satellite. Maybe you can see it better. Let me see if this can work. Mm -hmm. Maybe the resolution won't work. If you look closely, perhaps you can look at if the zoom resolution isn't very good. You can look on your own. When you look on the satellite, you see on on the bay, you see many little dots. Dots, 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 especially on the coast, dots, dots. Over here too, these white dots, right? These are sailboats uh, that, are, that are anchored there. And what, what, what I'm, by sailboats, I mean, you know, a normal residential sailboats. And these are sailboats of people who live on these sailboats and they live continuously uh, sailing up and down the, the, the the, the archipelago. Um, this bay is a highly cosmopolitan environment um, with its, we'll, we'll be speaking a little bit about what this, what this, what this the sea mean in the, in the context of Colera. But what I want to, what I, what I want to, to emphasize and I, what, I, what I highlight in the preface of the book is that on, on first arrival, you get off the ferry, you immediately confront it with a very heterogeneous and cosmopolitan environment rather than an isolated homogeneous location that is somehow left behind by history or, 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 or marginalized by the, by the Puerto Rican project. Um, I, I con so this is first impressions, you know, like where are these boats going? How come there's so many sailors here? Um, what's with this Chinese? What's with the Swiss? How come, you know, what's, what, you know, all these, these are questions that start uh, on my, I uh, start developing during my first impression. However, of all the connections that I was starting to appreciate, perhaps the one that, that struck me the, the most um, strongly was the, the presence of elements of English Caribbean, English Caribbean people and English Caribbean culture and English Caribbean presence on the island of, of, of Culebra. By English Caribbean culture, I'm talking about, <clears throat> a, for example, a, a very when those very common a theme that you get when you go to Culebra in terms of its nightlife. It's you hear a lot of calypso, reggae, 
alongside salsa, bachata, and other kinds of music that are mostly associated with, with Latin America. There's also a very strong, the, the, the presence of the English Caribbean is also very present in people's conversations, in people's biographies, and how is it that, and um, the sense of like, let's say, the geographical orientation of the average, when, when you live in Culebra, you, you, there's, there's, there's this, you feel the presence of the, of the British Caribbean. Um, another instance of the presence of the British Caribbean is that is the island of St. Thomas, that I'm pointing here, is visually present from, visually, you can see it from Culebra, it's very, Right. And likewise, from St. Thomas, you can see you, all these all these islands are you can they're they're in visual reference to it, to, to each other. You can all see it, right. So why is this interesting? Why is why is it interesting that there's a presence of British Caribbean um, in 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 Culebra? Um, so here, um, this is interesting because and here I have to put on my Caribbeanist hat. Um, the the anthropological record on the Caribbean, if you look it up today, not just anthropological record, but in the, in the public discourse and the public imagination, there is this a consistent narrative that fragments the archipelago according to its colonial imperial history. So for I'll give, so Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico are consistently described as a unit, right? As a unit that is that uh, as a unit that is linked to the Spanish Empire, right? So uh, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Cuba are usually classified not just in the public discourse but also academics, like as part of Latin America, the Latin American context, right? And um, um, by Latin America, we're talking the, the drop-down menu comes down: salsa, mixed race, uh, Spanish-speaking, Catholic. Um, the cities follow a Roman design, you know, uh, Havana, uh, Santo Domingo, and Puerto Rico, the old towns, the streets are, 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 are gridded. Um, um, these are, these are uh, spaces that are the direct, that direct result of the expansion of Castilian hegemony in the, in the Americas. By contrast, you have uh, the so-called British Caribbean, Jamaica, the bulk of the Leeward Islands, these fellas over here, right? Trinidad and Tobago down in the south, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, obviously, and the Bahamas up, up, up here, the Cayman Islands. These are, these are clusters of islands that are associated with the British project in the Caribbean. Um, Haiti, Haiti, uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, um, are associated with the French Caribbean, Aruba, Bona, Aruba eh, Bonaire, and Curaçao with the Dutch Caribbean. Then I'll clarify what all this means in a, in a second. So what, what, this, what this means in a, I'll try to be brief so as not to bog you down with too much, too much history. Um, the anthropologist Sidney Mintz um, eh, describes these, these distinctions and he, he, he by, by, way, by way of critique and what he what he describes is that so whereas the the Spanish project in the Americas was about extending Castilian Catholic culture to the Americas, so their their, their approach to colonialism was very much to colonize sites, you know, to send to send specific, specific Catholics to send Catholics over to settle and have them stay there for an extended period of time. Develop and and develop a strong um, develop a strong sense of a continuation of Castilian culture in in the Americas. This contrast with British, French, and Dutch interests, which according to Sidney Mintz, were was more geared towards the accumulation of profits, right? accumulation of surplus value. So what Sidney Mintz described is a scheme whereby a capital is collected in London, um, labor collected from West Africa, right? Um, a trans and, tra and these are transplanted to, to, let's say Jamaica, let's say, where these um, are gonna be invested in sugar, tobacco, coffee, or other a, a, a cotton a, a plantation interests. 
And once, the, once you get a sizable return on your investment, then the investor cast, a, a, cashes out. So what we have this, with, so the, according to Sydney means the effects that this has on, on the islands, let's say, I mean, he's, he has special attention to the case of Jamaica. So he describes Jamaica as, a, as, a, as an island that is, has a higher proportion of African descendants because you know, most of you know, white Europeans, they were not really invested in the plantation system. If there were white people, they were managing, they were managing the site or mixed race people were, were managing the location. Um, you also have a city, let me zoom into Kingston. So you see a city that developed not necessarily according to Roman planning, designing Madrid, but it's a, it's a much more organic city. It's a much more organic city that, that grows out according to the, to the comings of goings of the, of the, of, of the harbor. You also, regarding the language, um, um, Car Caribbean English is, according to Sydney Mintz, has a much stronger, how do I say, Africanized accents and articulations to it in opposition to Spanish Caribbean, where there might be an accent, but there's still a very strong a continuity between Castilian language and the language spoken in Cuba, Dominican Republic, and, 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 and Puerto Rico. Um, in the case of France, well, uh, Haiti, as we familiar, those familiar with the case of Haiti, Haiti had its own revolution in the early 19th century. Um, it was a famous slave, a slave revolt, highly successful um, um, at, at, at the time. Whereas the islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe here on the, on the Eastern Caribbean, today they are incorporated territories of France. They, they use the Euro and it's French customs that, that you pass when you're going to uh, Martinique and, 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 and Guadeloupe. So the image that Sydney Mintz is, is presenting with his, with his critique is that uh, it, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is an archipelago that even though they're born out a, a common experience of European expansion in the, in the Americas, um, uh, an emerging globalization, uh, global capital, you know, with, with different moving parts in different parts of the world. Um, um, even though, yeah, emerging global capitalism, emerging plantation system, emerging uh, imperialism, uh, colonialism, still each region, even though they both have of the same experience, each region is categorized in a different, in different cultural pa a, a particularities. And these distinctions are naturalized, are taken, are taken for granted, right? Um, um, and this is something that you're just gonna have to trust me that it's, it's, in, the, it's in the record and it's reproduced in academia as well. Cuba, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico are not discussed in the same context as Haiti, Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago. This is something that right that has to be clear in the in the, in 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 the in, in the record. So in this academic and discursive context, where the Caribbean is fragmented into distinct colonial spaces, it is surprising, anachronistic perhaps, to find let's say Jamaicans living in in Cuba, or or you know people from Trinidad and Tobago working in the oil fields of Venezuela. Or as I was observing, um, people in Culebra, oh, I lost my place, excuse me. People in Culebra, um, which is an island that responds to all the, you know, a historical cultural categorizations of being part of Latin America, Spanish empire. It is interesting or anachronistic to find a space full of Latin Americans, right? listening to West Indian, British Caribbean music, speaking in the West Indian Caribbean accent, familiar, familiar with, with the dynamics and politics of, 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 British, of British Caribbean culture. So I was interested in this, in this contradiction. Um, and this is what motivated me to consider doing a, a, a research project, an anthropological research project in Culebra to, exa to examine this, uh, apparent or possible a, a contradiction, and what does it mean for the for the ethnographic record? Okay, so what I what I did with this this theme of you, you go to the bars and you listen to calypso, 
you start, you know, you start playing music with, with locals and they were interested in reggae, rather than salsa, you know, other kind of musical genres that I wasn't familiar with. If you live in, if you live in San Juan, in the capital, by the way, if you live in Puerto Rico, your music state, your music scape is, is, you know, whatever is popular in the United States and in Latin America, right? So, okay. um, uh, Calypso, Soca, Mento, uh, Reggae, these are these are these are these are genres that are firmly associated with uh, with the British Caribbean. So, what I was what I did with this information, which, which when I when I started, what I did with this was started to my my concern, my complaint was that this emphasis on thinking of the archipelago as divided according to colonial histories isolated the region. It parted from a, from a premise of the isolated island, right? The isolated island, disconnected from, 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 from the world. And I felt that these, these kinds of perspectives, they were not, they were being imposed on the site. They were not coming from the islanders themselves because the experience of the islanders themselves, Culebra specifically, because I was looking at this, is one of high mobility and high migration not just migration to the United States, as it is well documented over throughout the 20th century, there's an established diaspora, Puerto Rican diaspora in, in, in the entire United States. Not just that, but also extensive migrations across the entire archipelago going, going eastward, right, eastward. This also connected to this idea of, of mobility is this, this, this um, consistent presence of the sea and the ocean in Culebra's story. Um, I can, this, is, this sounds very anecdotal, but I cannot, I'll just share it with you. I can't emphasize this enough. The, 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 the dominant theme of conversations when, when you're there is, is not sports or, or boxing or what's in the news, but sailing and, and water and, and having a boat and, and, um, and fishing practices and sailing, you know, these are, these, and also you go into people's houses and there's lots of, you know, decorations on seashells and coral reefs, um, popular tattoos of mermaids and anchors, you know, like, like and, or turtles, you know, dolphins. And there's this, um, the main food staple, obviously is fish, right? So the sea uh, get, kept, keeps implying itself in my, in when I, when, when you're there and it just comes obviously and it's such a small island, you're always in contact with the, with the sea, or, right? So what I was doing, my first, the first place I went with these Matias was like, okay, so let us, I, my, my pitch, my pitch when I went to, went to Manchester is that, look, this, this, this story of the Caribbean that you English people keep, keep repeating, <laughs> Is a very, is 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 a land-based narrative. It is based on it, it reproduces this notion of, of the national empire, England, you know, empire, and um, and it does it is not taking into account local discourses that that are that local discourses and practices that point more towards a a nomadic lifestyle, a mobile lifestyle right a life that is that is that is in transit you know a life that is that is people in transit like those sailboats that are on the bay i like that and this is not a uh, limited to culebra but you know that I, you know it, the, if, if you look carefully enough um in the in the ethnographic record there's plenty of instances of across of inter-island migration uh, throughout <laughs> since ever since pre-European pre pre, uh, pre pre European times. So my pitch to the to the to Manchester was I remember I remember in my proposal I, I put the word chaos, right? We were, like chaos rather than order. Right. So I had this theme that imperialism, right, enlightenment, rationalism, you know, draws these lines in the sea and these distinctions and these and these and these categorizations. However, the experience of the islanders is actually much more mobile and much more chaotic and much more open-ended. And people ultimately do not respond to the um, loyal, you know, the, don't have necessary loyalties to the to the to the to the to the formal to the formal empire. 
right? So that was my that was my pitch to them. Um, it changed a bit. I'll, I'll get later as I go on. And my my for my master's project was I made a film. By the way, the, the course that I that I applied to in Manchester was the visual anthropology course. It's basically a filmmaking course. They teach you the technical and conceptual skills of ethnographic filmmaking. And as Victor was saying in the introduction, I, I, I work with film festivals. I've made, I've made a few films and recently I've been developing an interest in sound ethnography. That's for another day. But I just wanna give a context that my MA and PhD were I made films, documentaries as part of, my, of, the, of, of the research. So for the MA film, um, the MA film is called Working the Restless Seas. It's on VHS, if you, can, if you wanna date that, it's a long, <laughs> long time ago. So the idea of working with the restless seas, I wanted to describe the sea as a, the ocean as an active location. I wanted to oppose the kind of representations that we see here in Google map, right? Where the sea is just this homogeneous blue, right? Um, this, this idea of the homogeneous blue contrasts with local experiences of, of Culebra where people, um, there's, there's deep knowledge on, on currents, on the dates of the of when turtles come to come to lay their eggs, um, um, weather is super important for the hurricane hurricane season, and just uh, I wanted to make, make the case that the 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 island experience is not limited to the land, that the island does not stop at the beach, it's not it doesn't end air, but actually spills out, it sort of reverberates out to the to the neighboring to its neighboring seas. And what I, and if it and also I wanted to make the case that it's the same for Saint Thomas, for Vieques, for all these other islands. So I wanted to have this image of from from Culebra, you have these ripple effects that comes up, and then all the other islands also have a ripple effect that that come up. Yeah. So I wanted to make a case. I moved away from it, but I wanted to make the case for the Virgin Islands as a common space, a common cultural experience, right? Common social space and opposed views that separate the islands according to their jurisdiction or imperial history. So I did that. I, I passed the MA barely, but I but I passed. <laughs> I stayed for the for the for the PhD. And my excuse me, my <clears throat> so the motivation for the so if the MA was more of a research exercise, um, for the PhD, I, you know, it was, a, it was a stronger commitment of four years. And the, the idea was to make a feature length documentary and, what, and write the draft of, the, of what, what later became the, 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 the book. So I started the PhD project uh, following through with the MA, this idea of a life in transit, a life in movement, chaos, instability. I wanted to emphasize on discourses of Caribbean creolization. For the non-specialists, give me a second to articulate what do I mean by a creolization. Um, can I write on the chat? Let's see. I wanna, mm -hmm. no, okay, don't know how to do it. I'll leave it there. Creole, a, 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 a creole creolization. So um, the, the concept of creolization, in, it, it's, it, com it comes from the French uh, creole, in Spanish criollo, um, is, is basically uh, how, I, how I, like the, the, the one-on-one way of introducing, it's a, of describing it, it's, it's, a, it's a concept used to describe the mixed race subject or the subject that's out of place. So in, from the Castilian perspective, criollo, in my understanding, I'm sure we all have our different ways, the way I have, understood it is that Creo, the term Creole or Criollo enters the Castilian vocabulary in order to describe the white subject that is born in the tropics, right? This, what this does is that this breaks a sense of continuity between race, culture, and place, right? It breaks the Creole subject, breaks that, that presumed continuity between place, race, and consciousness. Right? That, that the Creole subject breaks that. And it breaks that in numerous ways by a white person not born in, in Europe or Africa, a black person not born in Africa, but also what happens when, when, these, when these people start, start mixing into it. And when I say mixing, I don't mean just having children. We're also talking conceptual mixing, linguistic, linguistic mixing, right? And so the, the, 
if you if you you take any course or any textbook on 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 Caribbean anthropology, Creole is going to Creolization is going to be one of the root concepts to describe the region. It's a region of in Creolization. It's a region in a process of of mixture, in a process of of, of becoming. So I wanted my my pitch for for the PhD was to emphasize on Creolization, emphasize on movement and mixing. And, and instability in, or, and in order to counter this view of the static isolated, isolated island. The, the feature length documentary that I did, uh, Victor mentioned it in, uh, Victor, tell me when to stop. How much, how much time I have, yeah. So um, the feature length documentary that I pitched, uh, Victor mentioned it, Mangrove Music, as the title suggests, is a, is a film about two music groups that live on the that live on the that work on the island. So one music. Um, the reason my main interest from music was primarily cinematic. I felt that uh, music making, music playing, is a theme that lends itself well to cinema. My MA film was based on interviews, and I was a bit disappointed that that you know that I was using a visual medium but ultimately falling back on text and words in order to describe a, a story. For the PhD, I wanted to do something more ambitious and, and, and use cinematic techniques, right? And do, some, and do a film that does not require much verbal articulation in order to, to, to make sense. So I felt that you know, music playing and percussion is not, it's not something that, that is easily describable with words, but it's very appropriate for, for cinema. The second motivation for making a film about musicians is more about the sociology of the music, the, the music politics of these groups. So of the two groups, one of them um, is still active today, by the way, they've been playing for 30 years. And if you go to Culebra, they'll be there on Saturday night on the bar that's on the, that's on the bay. Um, these are three brothers. Um, they play, three, they play uh, eight congas. Congas is the drum that you play by hand. And it's a, it's a percussion group. That's all, it's, it's purely percussive and they sing. And the, it's percussive, but, but each congas has a different pitch. So they do melody every, every, every now and then. And it's a highly popular group. They do sing-alongs and they're extremely, they're very popular on the island. And they've done a few tours around, the, around, around Puerto Rico as well. The kind of music politics that they, that they reference is, uh, Af is what, ethnomusicologists called afro puerto rican music so this is this is basically percussive music that is associated with the coastal regions of puerto rico specifically this town you see the town here loisa loisa this is a um, town is still obviously the town is still there today but the main narrative is that is a, loisa is one of many towns in Puerto Rico that was started, founded by escaped slaves, right? So these are the spaces on, on Puerto Rico that are high, that are associated or regionalized as markers of Afro, you know, Afro-Caribbean culture. So the kind of music that these, that these brothers play every Saturday is musicologically, ethnomusical, a reference to this, to this Afro-Puerto Rican culture. This is, this is compelling because um, this, this, this story of the Afro Puerto Rican is a theme that um, is, is, a, is a consistent narrative in Puerto Rican identity politics in relation. Uh, it, 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 is, it is a theme when talking about what is Puerto Rico's relationship to the United States, what are the terms of the Puerto Rican franchise. So what, I, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that this, this theme that the brothers were playing Afro-Puerto Rican music is a direct reference to the Puerto Rican project, to Puerto Rican identity politics, looking west, shall we, shall we say. The second group that I, was, that I was filming was the municipal band. At the time, it was the, the municipal band. And this, um, this band was composed entirely of steel drums. The steel drum, zoom out a bit. The steel drum story goes is the, the only acoustic instrument invented in the 20th century. That's a story. I picked it up somewhere and I'm selling it as I, as I bought it. Not sure if it's true, but it's a, it's a nice story I like to. Trini it was invented on the island of Trinidad. 
down here, north coast of, on the north of Venezuela. So this part of the, of the Americas is oil rich, right? And today there's lots of oil still being pumped out from there. So what happens in the, in the World War II years, um, a, a young, I mean, according to ethnomusicologists that have studied this uh, steel drum music, young urban working class uh, Afro descendant men uh, who work in the oil refineries start taking the discarded oil drums from the harbors and start you know, making music with them. Yeah? Through, through what must have been an extraordinary process of, of trial and error, right? Um, they invented what's the, the steel drum. So imagine, so the drum is a cylinder. I don't have a cylinder here. A cylinder, right? You cut, you cut the, to make a bass drum, you leave it, you leave, you leave the drum in its entirety. To make a higher pitch drum, you cut, you cut the, the top of it so that it resonates tighter. And then on the lid, then you, you submit the lid to fire and you bang it out with a hammer and you make like cells inside it. So, and you, with a little hammer, you hit those cells and each cell would have a different note. And it sounds like a bell. Ding, dong, 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 right? Okay. The, the, the steel drum became a very popular instrument in the 1950s and 60s. And it was effectively the, the it is the sounds of Trinidadian independence when, you know, when, when Trinidad and Tobago were negotiating with the, with the rich crown, the, 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 their independence, um, the steel drum became a very powerful symbol of treaty identity, not just Trinidadian identity, but broader English Caribbean identity, the steel, the, okay. so I recommend you, so steel drum, steel like the mineral and, and drum. Um, when, if you look it up on, on YouTube, you're gonna find a wide range of uses. You're gonna find orchestras, but you will also find solo players. Okay, so um, the, during the year that I was doing field work, the municipality of Culebra, the town administration, acquired a set of steel drums from the island of St. Croix, which is this fella here. In the island of St. Croix, there is a, a steel drum maker who's originally from Trinidad and Tobago. And he has basically, he's worked on most of the island. You know, he's going back and forth as, I mean, musicians are also highly mobile individuals and, and the steel drum, because it's, it's an artisanal instrument is, you know, there's no Yam, Yamaha is not doing steel drums. But so all the process of making it and maintenance and keeping them in tune, all this is handmade. And because it's percussion, you need a very good ear to identify the notes and, and work to it. So steel drum, let's say make technicians or maintenance are, 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 are in very, are very rare and in very, it's a very skilled craft. So there's a man living in Virgin Islands, Hilary, Hilary Baga is his name. And he made a set of steel drums for the municipality of, of, of Culebra. So during the year that I was there, I filmed the, the rehearsals of the group, um, <clears throat> the, the, the rehearsals, their gigs, what they, you know, how they interacted with each other. Most of the, most of the people that played in the steel drum orchestra were children, were minors. So this was, this was seen like more like a, like a youth, a, 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 a youth project. Whereas the drummers were, were adults, you know, it's like bar, bar culture, you know, drinking alcohol and partying. Whereas the, the steel drum was more, let's say, respectable, right? A, a, a after school program. So I made the film. Um, I can the, um, gladly share it. I have the files on, the, on a Google Drive. I'll just send the link to anybody interested in watching it. Um, okay, so what happened? So in the process of, of this field work and, and making this film and hanging out with the two bands and um, observing day-to-day -day life in, in Culebra, I, I uh, revisited my initial hypothesis or, or, or assumptions. So, so just to, to, to recap. So from I, when I went for the first time from San Juan, I imagined this isolated uh, location, homogenous, right? Everybody knows each other, socially conservative kind of thing, right? The process of living there deconstructed completely. And now the island is full of Swiss and German and, and South Americans, and there's a Trinidadian in every corner, steel drum music, alongside salsa is, you know, chaos, right? Swirls and movement, right? So, but in the process of making the film, 
it was an election year. It's very lucky as well. So I got to see all the political arguments and campaigns. In the process of being there, I started also noticing that these experiences of, let's call it nomadism or, or chaos or movement, co even though that is there, you also have I, I, the Culebrense Islanders have a very strong sense of, of belonging, a very strong sense of ownership of the place, a very strong sense of location and locality. And this was deployed extensively during the, during the it was election year, as I mentioned, during the political campaign. This narrative of, you know, there, there's three main parties. Well, at that time in Puerto Rico, there were three main candidates running for the mayor's office. It's a, it's a presidential system, by the way. So, so you vote for a mayor. There's, there is not like, like here in Europe, it's, you vote for a council and then they decide who the mayor is. Um, so, and the mayor uh, figure, in, in Puerto Rican politics, it's a very, it's a very powerful uh, uh, figure. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very present individual, um, not unlike the US, I, I, would, I would imagine, where the president has a very strong uh, 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 presence in the discourse. So in the political campaigns, these three candidates, they're all lobbying for the rights of the culebrenses and what is culebran in English, it would be, you know, the, and the culebran identity and protect the culebran franchise. And there was a sense of, um, um, they were accusing each other. Uh, you're not, uh, the opponents would say, you are not, you are here to advocate for the rights of Puerto Ricans. And these rich Puerto Ricans that are coming here and buying up our land. Or the, another ad candidate would say, no, you're the one that's advocating all these gringos that are coming here and buying up all the water and using the water for their pools, right? When there's, when, when, when there's droughts. So continuously back and forth in the political campaigns, there was this recurrent narrative of advocating for the culebran, the, the, the culebrense. The story of the culebrense, the culebra native, the culebra subject or indigenous person has a, has a history that in my, what I argue in the book, has a historical precedent in, in, the, in a grassroots political movement of the 1960s and 70s. So let me expand a bit. Um, so Puerto Rico is a colony of Spain, right? Since the late medieval period until 1898. What happens in 1898 is, um, the United States invades. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a U.S. invasion um, of Puerto Rico, and they kick the Spanish. <laughs> they kick the Spanish. This is in the context of the Spanish-American War. Um, it's it's a, I describe this extensively. The geopolitics of this in the in, in the book. Um, a quick summary would go something on the lines that the United States project. They've reached the Pacific, and and from reaching the Pacific, and now they start expanding. Out, outside of their national territories. Um, there's, um, there's extensive documentation uh, that shows how United States mirrored England in its, in, in its, in its position of imperialism of uh, exploiting maritime power. Maritime power, control of the seas gives you control of it. I, there's debates of this and I developed it in the book. Anyway, regardless of all this, 1898, Puerto Rico becomes a territory of the, of the United States. Um, and the United States the, uh, Ministry of Defense decides, I think it was a, a, a Franklin Roosevelt, decides that the island of Culebra is going to be used as a, as a, practice, as a practice range for, a, the, for the US Navy. So the US Navy uses the island for sea to land bombardments, so the battleship would come and, and shoot at the at targets that would be placed on the, on the island. Um, airplane raids, the planes would come and shoot at a, a target on the ground. And also uh, marine landings, like, you know, land, like, the, like Bay of Pigs type of landing or D-Day landings, that kind of stuff, right? Okay, so I described the story, how this, how this came about, the displacement that this represented for the local population, uh, the impact that, that the Navy presence had on, on, on Culebra infrastructure, on Culebra culture, even impacts on the flora and the fauna of the, of, of, of the island. But in the late, throughout 1960s and 1970s, a, um, a grassroots campaign uh, begins in Culebra um, and, they successful, and they were successful in 
through a variety of legal and illegal activities, civil disobedience, law cases, vandalisms, uh, legal and illegal, as I said earlier, case, they, they, managed, they managed to have the, expel the Navy from the island. Um, so it was Richard Nixon who signed the order that all military activity in Culebra be, be, be stopped. And so the Navy, the Navy left. Uh, this, this struggle, I dedicate a whole chapter in the, in the book, it's, it's chapter two. Um, and I, I suggest that this experience of the, of the, of the Navy activism the, uh, creates an other, created a na the, the US Navy created a, a putative other that was attempting against our island, our island uh, uh, interest. And I suggest that the, this, this narrative of being culebrense, of being local, being from there, is deeply connected to the anti-Navy struggle of the, 19, of, the, of the 1970s. And it has a legacy there, but it, it continues to be reproduced today in, in, different, in different forms. Okay, so what's the, I'm wrapping up now. I think this is the final thing. So, so, so the picture that I that I that I that I that I have is is there's a series of tensions here that I that that I grapple with in the in the book. You have a space that is discursively classified as isolated, right? And depending on the context, local 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 politicians will draw from that narrative in order to articulate their political program that we need more funding from the central government or a central government has us isolated, you know, that kind of victimizing stuff is, is, is there, right? At the same time, you have practices of mobility, right? That, and these mobilities, some of them are in tune with the United States imperialist program, such as the you know, diaspora of the United States, but in all, many of these movements, they subvert, they subvert the intentions that, so I said they subvert national or they don't, they, they're antagonistic or they're incongruent with the discursive classifications of the of the island, of the of, of, of the island space. Okay, so what we're looking at is how do you how how do you reconcile an insular identity that is based on a on a political struggle, a very legitimate and powerful legitimate struggle, with practices and discourses of mobility and, and chaos. How do you how do you do that, right? So I was my <clears throat> at first, I struggled a lot with this question. I, I at one point I had this idea of dividing my thesis my dissertation into two parts. Part one is insularity, <laughs> part two is is mobility. But as I started doing that that table, I my where I ended up in was the story that these two let's say forces, the global and the local, the insular and the mobile. The, the colonized and the empire, right? The land and the sea, right? All these, all these kind of categories, they're not antagonistic to each other, but they inform each other. They inform, they inform each other. So this idea of being culebrense is informed by knowledge of the English Caribbean and the Spanish Caribbean, right? This idea of culebra music is informed, has, has multiple references. This idea that you're drawing from multiple references to create your sense of self. Mm -hmm. So what I ended up in is that this, the, this island space is simultaneously isolated and connected, simultaneously static and mobile, simultaneously local and global. So how to call this, 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 this cosmos and polis, this here and there, this right. How do you how do you how do you reconcile that contradiction without calling them schizophrenic? Without you know how is this you know how is this a positive? Uh, how is this comes together into an effective uh, political or musical uh, program? So the idea of transinsularism is is uh, was not my invention. It came up in a brainstorm. Actually, my supervisor was the one who, who said it for the first time, and I I, I wrote it down and I and I, and I ran with it. But the uh, from my perspective, the the main inspiration for this 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 word, which I don't know yet if it's working or not, is um, the literature on transnationalism, you know, yeah, Glick Schiller, Lingabash, etc. So it, Nations Unbound, the now classic a, a book. 
So what I what I what I was interested about this so about this transnationalism uh, discourse is that you have you have two two locations, right? You have two locations that are that are distinct. They're different. This is this is this and this is that. It's different, right? There's different dynamics, but there's there's a lot, there's so much movement between them, and there's so much traffic between the two spaces that whatever happens here has an impact on what happened on, on over here on this on this on this other side that's one thing that motivates so whatever happened in St. Thomas in Puerto Rico in New York in Venezuela has an imp on Trinidad and Tobago has an impact on on the musical culture on fishing practices and land policy debates in, 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 in Culebra. The other theme of transnationalism that interested me is that so is that this notion that Yes, there's lots of movement between two sites. Let's say movement between between Culebra and Saint Thomas, right? Culebra and Saint Thomas. There's lots of movement, illegal mostly because these are different jurisdictions. So if you cross it, you have to do customs and stuff. But people don't care; they just go. It's not really police that much. So there's so much movement between these two places. However, these two places still retain their sense of individuality. St. Thomas is not Culebra. Culebra is not St. Thomas. Okay. Uh, um, the same way that Culebra is not Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not Culebra. Culebra is not English Caribbean. It, you know, that kind of, that. so the, the idea of transinsularism is, 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 is a means to, to describe that, bring two words together, the insular, that is transient, that is informed by other sites. And it, it, the, yes, it is an insular location, but it's informed by transients, by people traversing that are that are traversing that are traversing a, through it. Um, this con this idea of transinsularism has has a cousin <laughs> is related a little bit with uh, the idea of. Um, literature that has with associated with Edouard Glissant in the uh, French Caribbean scholar. Um, he writes about um, archipelagic thinking, archipelagic, and to think like an archipelago, right? To think like an archipelago. And what, um, what archipelagic thinking sort of proposes or talks about is that to not look at, at islands as a unit, as an isolated location, but to look at the island in the context of its neighbors, of its of its of its of its, of, of its connections, but Glissant takes it so, and Glissant is making this case. This he's making a case for a Martiniquean independence from France, and in order to construct a, a, a project of sovereignty in opposition to France, Glissant and company, they develop the idea of a, of, a, of an Antillean identity, you know, an Antillean. Creole identity, not European, you know, a local, a local identity. But this local identity is informed by the archi by the relationships in the archipelago. Glissant doesn't stop there. He continues and say, look, this and this idea of archipelago does not only relate to the Caribbean region, but we can also start thinking of the world as an archipelago. Right? So, so archipelagic thinking is what happens. When you look at the world from the perspective of an island, I think that's what how Glissant writes it. Where you see, you know, where you see a, you know, a like I said, like, like I said earlier, capital from London, labor from West Africa, sugar transplanted from Morocco, taken to Cuba, developed, you know, harvested and developed, sold back into Europe for 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 a profit. This profit in terms circulates back to America. You know, this kind of this kind of so rather, so it is it is a it is a, a view that places the ocean not as, as a background, but at the foreground of, of history. Yeah. So um, the and it's kind of like a reorientation of the gaze, you know, rather than think of planet Earth, this planet water. Right. The Earth is made of water, and so, so, and and these, you know, these bits of islands that you see here, you know, all the, these are these are, you know, if you have water, right? These are bits of land that come up and then back down again, back down and back up again, back down, and so on again. And is the idea of the sea as a unifying feature of the human experience, right? So the sea does not connect, but does not isolate, but 
but, but, but it connects. Okay, those are broad strokes that I that I cover in in in, in the book. Um, I cover much more topics in the book, but I'll draw a line here and uh, take take questions in case I forgot anything. Um, yeah, I don't see. Uh, this is Giovanni Bernardo. <laughs> Hi, Carlo. Thank you very much for this uh, for your uh, talk. I mean, it was it was extremely uh, um, valuable to 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 me. It resonates with me with uh, all sorts of experience that I have being a Polynesianist, <laughs> and so I mean, the idea of the ocean and the sea being the land and not the actual, you know, being the, the connecting part and not the dividing part. This uh, it really resonates with the whole literature on Polynesia mm -hmm. and, and the literature even uh, written by local, basically by Polynesianists uh, themselves, not just by by white people, <laughs> let's say. Um, but I have I have uh, also oh, I have another thing that resonates with me a lot is the is the is the steel drums you know i have i have my both my children play the steel drums at school and they i mean here then i that's a good school you have them uh, here then i you in the cup we have a center for steel drums which is uh, famous all over the world and that we have liam um who is uh, a master of the uh, recognized throughout the world and he is from from uh, Trinidad, but then migrated to the States and now is teaching here at NIU, uh, Northern Illinois University. I don't know if you've heard about the Center for Steel Drumming. So that that's really that's really um, um, that's really uh, was fun to to hear about mm. that, you know. Um, but uh, on top of this various you know comments that other people want to want to make too, I'm sure uh, there is there is one little question that I have about how come that cholera first of all is called cholera and second why does it belong to 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 Puerto Rico and not to the British Virgin Island? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, yes. that's, I know that you know the history. No, there's a, no, really there's really a story curious. to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, okay, so yeah, I, I cover this in the book. Thanks, thanks you, Giovanni. Um, I didn't know there was a center for steel drum. I'll look it up uh, yeah. for sure. I'm drop them an email. Yeah. Um, okay, so why is it called? Uh, there's yeah, I covered this in the in the in the text in the in the book. I have a history chapter. Okay, let's zoom in. So um, you look up. I have a map here. From the 1700s, 1775, I have it on the wall. What you're seeing there is, you know, <laughs> right? So you look up maritime charts of the of the colonial era. Uh -huh. The island of Culebra, depending on the language that is the, the, of the map, is labeled Passage Island or Il uh -huh. du Passage, or Isla yeah. Passage, right? right. Passage, a, a passage, pa passage island. Um, the island was not consistently inhabited according to the archeological records. Um, there are, there is plenty of archeological material, but there's no evidence of, 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 set, of, of settling for extensive period of time. What you do see, what you do see, and now, in the, now by, the, by, the, by the 19th century, uh, what you do see is an increasing uh, encroachment of French and Dutch and British interests in the Caribbean, right? And I think France made an outright offer to buy Vieques from, from Spain. Um, by, by the late 19th century, this, the, the US, what's today the US Virgin Islands, was a territory of Denmark. King of Denmark, you know, you go, you go, you go to the, the names, the names of the towns and names of places in St. Thomas and St. Croix down here are Danish. The names of the street, the names of the towns are, are, are Danish. So, so what you what you see in, in Culebra is um, is the island is not consistently inhabited, and um, there is a there is a concern from the Spanish authorities in San Juan that they're losing out on their territories. Not just are they losing out to uh, other imperial interests, but that 
how do I say this? These islands are increasingly being populated by escaped slaves, by marauders, by pirates, by people sent off the law, right? And they're losing control of the archipelago. They're losing control of the, of the, of the situation. Not only are like Danish of all people, Danes and, and, and British and the French, but also escaped, they're losing control of the situation. All right, so in the 1880s, 1880s, um, I forget the specific dates, I have to look it up in Europe, but early 1880s, a series of, there was a, a entrepreneurs from San Juan made an offer to the governor of Puerto Rico to industrialize the island, to go there and use it this, because it's a, it's a very, the currents and the winds of the region it make make the island a very easy place to to stop by in the age of sail. You you normally you normally pass by normal by there. So these industrialists they were interested in making a deep harbor on the island, right? To use the island as a harbor for passing boats that need wood, that need charcoal, that need water, right? To make it as a as a as as, as a stopping point. The governor of Puerto Rico uh, denied this proposal, and instead. A, this, a made a decision, which I describe in, in the book, to militarize the island, to, mil to turn the island into a military fort, to stop that, to minimize the encroachment of other European powers establishing themselves in, in, in the area. So, a so that's one, so they, so they built military forts, shot the cannon, etc. and it started, but a company following the, the military garrison there was also the initiative of actively populating the island. Now, this, is, this, is in, in, this is consistent with Spanish policy towards the Americas where, where colonialism was about settling, was about settling and staying, right? And it's about, you know, yes, you can, you can get free transit, but you have to stay and build a house and marry and have children and sort of uh, stay there. So the, the Puerto Rican government they act. They start. They gave. They divided the plots into uh, the island into 100 plots of land of different sizes, and gave them out to, for free to whoever, whoever wanted them, right? But the person had to be a, a swear loyalty to the flag to, to Spain to the to, to the king of Spain. All right. So what we what, what I'm what I want to convey to you is that the, the process of colonizing Culebra was was an active policy to prevent further inc incursion of other European powers on, on the island. And it was a military operation uh -huh. uh, in, in, its, in, its, in, its, in, its, in its beginning. Why Culebra, the name? This is, this is uh, there's lots of debate. Culebra, the, the Spanish speakers in the room will recognize Culebra translates as snake in, in Spanish, in snake. And the island doesn't look anything like a snake. Not even when you're sailing, it looks it, it looks like a snake. The, the theme here is that when the when the military garrison arrived, they named the fort San Ildefonso de la Culebra. San Ildefonso. Ildefonso is a name. San mm -hmm. Ildefonso de la Culebra. San Ildefonso was a saint of the Dark Ages. And there's many towns in Central America founded in the late 19th century that have that name. Go to Guatemala. Well, there's many towns in San Ildefonso, it's a common name, right? right? But as you can imagine, San Ildefonso de la Culebra is many syllables. And with, with practice, at some point along the way, uh, the town stopped being called San Ildefonso and the whole place just started being called uh, Culebra. Culebra only, uh, okay. That's the story as I understand it, as I picked it up. Um, my main reference is just to be clear, um, the story I just told you, there's not much archive for it. Um, the stories I, that I'm telling you are stories that I collected from the islanders themselves. So uh -huh. this, what I'm describing is local history, okay? Yeah. I've yeah. spoken with archeologists, I've read all the archeological reports on the island and they don't contradict uh, local, local stories. I mean, so, and I give priority to that in, in the book. Yeah. Thank you, sure thank you, Carl. Thank you for your question. Okay, I'm sure there's a few more questions. So if you have a question, um, uh, if somebody wrote a question in chat. I'll okay, say here, Gitika. Yeah, um, let me see what oh, I got here. Okay, I'm reading Gitika De. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, can you, do you find such a card in it? I don't find it. Can you read it? Oh, I'm in the chat. Okay, so I'm in the Zoom chat. Uh, oh, I see it. Right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that. I have two questions. The Jamaican British sociologist Stuart Hall talks about two Jamaicans in his autobiography, Familiar Stranger. Do you find such a heterogeneity in Culebra? The second question relates to how or whether the islands reconcile the ambivalence arising from their continuum of inter-island migration vis-a-vis -vis their historically discursive identity. Okay. So I'm not familiar with the specific book, Familiar Stranger, I'm sorry, but I am familiar with Stuart Hall's a, a work. So I'll, I'll, I won't reference the, the autobiography, but other material that, 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 he has, that he has published. So in my, my reading of Stuart, uh, Stuart Hall's work, he, um, especially in his later years, my understanding, he becomes so, um, he, he writes a lot about of, uh, the Jamaican diaspora and, and the sense of estrangement of being of, because you accumulate experience in so many places, you're, you're a stranger everywhere, right? You're a stranger in Jamaica, stranger in England, a stranger in Europe, stranger in the Americas. So how do you, how do you reconcile the sense of global cosmopolitanism with a local identity, with having a sense of, 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 fixed, of fixed location. Um, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't see that kind of theme going on in, in Kula. Even, even, it's really interesting, even amongst immigrants that have lived and settled there, I, I have found, um, I, I mean, perhaps we can, you can elaborate on your question later, but I have found that this course of Culebrense or Culebran to be a very, while, while it is deployed inconsistently, while it is deployed at different, in different ways, it is, it is, it is very present. It's a very, it's a very confident, uh, uh, it's a very confident uh, idiom to, to, to use. So I think that this theme of, 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 of locality and being from here is something that is, that is very present in, 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 in Culebra. Um, Sorry, as I'm as I'm speaking, I'm thinking of exceptions. Excuse me, let me clarify. I'm thinking of exceptions now. Okay, yes. Sorry, I found um, um, I have one. So, my one of my best friends in Culebra, my main, what you could say, one of my main informants. Um, she has been living in Culebra for over forty years. Uh, all her family. She had three children in, in Culebra. Um, her, her husband is a, is a man that was born and bred in, in Culebra, but she wasn't. She was born in New York City, um, uh, part of the uh, Puerto Rican diaspora. And something that I find really interesting, and this is something that she tells me herself, that she says that she's been working as a social worker in Culebra for 40 years, has had three children, and she finds it interesting that her children are treated as locals, but not her. <laughs> yeah, there are certain spaces of Culebra society that you won't have access to if you're not born and bred and develop meaningful relationships in the place, or by not just relationships, but also activities and practices in the, in, 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 in the place. Some of these spaces are like, for example, specifically political credibility. So this person I'm talking about, she's been living there for 40 years. She's been done extensive work with, with the youth, has written a lot of proposals, got lots of funding for the community to build elderly people's home, is now currently engaged in building a theater on the, on the island, but she still does not get invited to community meetings. So, certain, so, so, so to the answer to the whole question is not that there's two culebras in the thing that there's two Jamaicas, but what I say is that there's many culebras. There's many culebras. And early, image that I had when I was doing my field work was of the, and this was not my idea, it's the idea of a local, he described, you know, the Olympic logo, all these mm -hmm. Olympic rings, right? So imagine the island in the middle and each, each ring represents a, a network, right? And they all intersect on the island, right? So you have the West Indians, you have the Europeans, you have the Americans, the Puerto Rican, right? And they're all intersecting on the island. So I wouldn't say two Jamaicans, but 
many, many, many culebras. Do the islanders reconcile the ambivalence? Um, um, chapter three of, of my book is a, is a description of, well, it, the main source of this material is the, is a, is, is the election, the political campaigns that were happening when I, when, when, when I was there. So what is, so once the Navy leaves, right? Victor said in the introduction, the Navy left, but they didn't take all the toys with them. They left behind all the bullets and crap and tanks and stuff there. Um, uh, what, is, what is fascinating here is, the, is that the island almost immediately became branded as a tourist destination. And this is really interesting story where you have coexisting imagery of war, and hell, right? I call it hell war and Garden of Eden paradise, you know, sun, sex, and sun. These two things are coexisting at the, at, at, at the same time. So you look up any Airbnb or hotel thing, Culebra, you're gonna find adjectives of beautiful, untouched paradise, you know, beautiful coral reefs, come see the unspoiled nature on Culebra, right? Visit with the locals and the natives. That kind of vocabulary is, on, is in all the publicity and marketing campaigns. And what is not mentioned is that everything that you see is man-made or man, you know, is, is, is you know, the product of, of, of military a, a, a interventions. So in chapter three, I describe the ways in which the islanders reconcile with this ambiguity on a, on a political level when it comes to, when it comes to, the, a, to, to voting and allocating resources. Um, so how do they reconcile it? I want to say read the book, <laughs> but the answer is they do, they do, and in very creative ways and in very interesting ways. Um, I think every every chapter of the book is an attempt to describe different ways in which this contradiction is lived, is reconciled, and it is not it is not reconciled easily. That's something that I want to emphasize. It's not an easy place to live in. It's 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 physically very demanding emotionally very draining. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of people living in a small space, very heterogeneous location, big attitudes. There's a lot of stake, there's a lot of emotion. And, and um, a, I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, how do they reconcile it? Not easily. Um, there's, a, there's a concept that I try to develop in the book, but it, it's only mentioned here and there, and I, but I don't quite uh, follow it through. Maybe in a, in a sequel, I'll develop it. This idea of dwelling in struggle, dwell in struggle. So to live, to live in a place like this is, is a, I call it a, a struggle, a struggle with coming to terms with all these contradictions, right? The, the, the struggle of that. And that is, that is something that I, that I try to capture in, in the book. Yeah, so I hope that, that, that answers the question. Okay, so Lorenzo excuses himself that he has to leave. Nicole Hernandez, I was wondering how does Vieque fits in? Does Culebra get talked more about because currently the military president? No, 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 no. Culebra fits. Well, Culebra does not fit in that in in the book um, because an editorial decision. Nicole, uh, you know, uh, anthropology. You know, I did field work in Culebra, primarily in Culebra. I visited Vieques extensively, St. Thomas and Croy. I visited all these, all, all these, all these places. But when you are, I don't know, when you're writing, and you have to, you know, the story has to end <laughs> somewhere. Um, and 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 I did not include Vieques features in in the book, but it's not it's not the main site of research, shall we say? Um, for those in the in the Zoom that don't know, Vieques is the island just south of Culebra. You see it on the on the, on the map, um, much larger. Um, when the Navy left Culebra, they moved to Vieques. And there they, they did the same kind of exercise, but with more recent technology and the bombardments there were brutal, but much, much more intense than in, than in Vieques. And the Navy eventually left Vieques after a, a, another grassroots protest in the 1990s. And they ended up, uh, the, the, the grassroots pressure on the Pentagon was just too much and, and the Navy just had to leave and close their operation in, 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 in Vieques. But like in Culebra, the lands in Vieques that have been bombed are not usable. They're not, they're heavily polluted. It's very dangerous sites to visit. 
and they're closed off and they're now part of a the managed by um, by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, it's not that I talk about Culebra because it's close to St. Thomas. It's I talk about Culebra because I did my field work there. That's, that's, that's why. Mm. Um, okay, Cassie. I'm reading Cassie's excellent conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cheers. Okay, thank you. Uh. I can see we don't have any questions here in chat, but are there any questions from people who just want to verbalize their questions? I have one or two uh, questions, but I'm going to wait for other people. Uh, Ziggy, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, it's a simple question, I think, but you mentioned early that uh, most of the foreigners seem to have the big businesses there. So what happens to, how do the natives make a living? Yeah, and isn't realize. there some, yeah. is there a class caste yes. uh, tension there? Yes, let me organize my thoughts. Yes, the answer is yes, uh, but I wanna be fair here. So in the in the in chapter three, one of the where I describe all this tourism economy, right? The development of the of the of the tourism economy on the island after the navy leaves, uh, the main economy on the island is to, and today it is it's it's the main driving force of the of the economy is is, is is tourism. All right. So so tourism generates you know there's many different industries such as. Uh, water taxis, car rentals, uh, hotels, restaurants, and it is the main is the main economy on the island. So when I was doing a field work, a, a, a okay, yeah, a debate that I engage with in the book is a, is a debate is a debate concerning a land access on, on Culebra. So um, when the Navy arrives and occupies the island, the, the local peasantry that's already living there, they get displaced, right? They get displaced, they're, they're forced to move, and that's why everybody lives on the southern part of, of, of the island. Um, after the Navy leaves, the former owners of the plots of land, they have, they have access, they, they, can, they, can, they have access to them. And something that, and okay, so, uh, my predecessor, there was, there was another anthropologist who went to Culebra like 15 years before I did. Mm -hmm. and, and he was he was observing, he was there when the land grab happened. This is a, they say like that in English, land grab, a land grab happened. When the Navy leaves, all these lands are made available and there's a ton of squatting and, and buying lands cheap and all the way. Now, obviously the people that were uh, buying all these, all these lands were, Foreigners, right? Quote, foreigners, wealthy, white, you know, Euro, Anglo eh, 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 people. Um, so my predecessor, he described this process as, as he called it coastal gentrification. Coastal gentrification. And using the metaphor from urban gentrification where the local population is displaced, right? In favor of new wealthier residents that come in, all the rent prices go up, et cetera. And it changes the whole aesthetic program of the, of the of, you have Starbucks opening all of a sudden. So my predecessor, he described this thing as a coastal gentrification and coastal gentrification represents a threat to the continuity of a Culebrense identity, right? That's, that's what he saw and that's what, what, that's what he describes. 15 years later, I come and I see a very different picture. Um, yes, I do see a coastal gentrification, but what I also see is that um, in a way, those rich Americans that bought land for millions of, of euros per acre, mm -hmm. they bought it from the locals. Okay, mm -hmm. so it is the locals that get that money. It is the locals mm -hmm. that, that, that get the profit mm -hmm. of that. It is the locals who did the selling, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, it is, and it is the locals who use that money to then invest in a car rental business. And now today that's the biggest car rental thing. It is the locals who, you know, who, who, who use that plot of land. Yes, they, they sold half of the plot of land for the hotel, right? 
and, and they, have, they have a stake in the hotel, they have an investment in the hotel. So what I wanna get at is that yes, if, if yes, there is a class caste divide, absolutely. And, and it is good to think with, but I don't go to the bank with that, with that divide because it's, a, it's an interactive relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a, a rich Swiss, I have in mind Jack. Jack is a French Swiss, beautiful plot of land that he owns overlooking St. Thomas, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, he pays $50 an hour to some guy to cut his grass. Oh. A good money. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah, and also, and, and I don't think, I don't think there's anybody in Culebra, local or otherwise, that laments the tourism, the success of the tourism industry. What mm -hmm. is being debated, what is, what is of, of concern is what kind of tourism development is appropriate for the island. That's mm -hmm. hot topic. That's, yeah, that's what's happening. Yeah. But it's not like the DR. No. no, no, you don't have that gross disparity, no. Or, or sex tourism. No, 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 no. no it's nature is still very much anchored in nature tourism. Mm -hmm. Very much, yeah. yeah. Are there other questions? I think so. I had a, yes. Hi, it's Nicole. I had another question. I was wondering, like, how, um, like, whatever is often, I guess, talked about as the colony of the colony. Yeah. And how that factored into its, like, identity, yeah. um, like, animosity towards the main island. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So, this, this, this theme of, of uh, colony of the colony. Um, uh, it manifests itself on, on many instances. Primarily, I saw I, you see it more when when talking about obviously political matters and issues of, of, of power and, and discussions of, of political economy development and what kind of tourism show because the main the main tourist is Puerto Ricans. Those are those are the main the main tourists. Um, and it expresses itself also in mundane ways, such as when when Culebrenses speak of the reference to Puerto Rico, La Isla Grande, right? the, the big island, I'm going to the big island. And this already strikes a binary opposition of power between Culebra being the island and Puerto Rico, the, the, the continent, so to speak. Um, yeah, I don't know how to develop this, this, this theme further, but absolutely, I think this idea of Culebra being the junior partner in the Puerto Rican project is something that is felt a lot on, in, in, on the island. Um, it's reproducing the media as well, Nicole. If you're familiar with Puerto Rican media, Culebra is always described as an exotic location over there, you know, them people, you know, although there's a hurricane coming, although oh, I wonder how they're doing. Or Culebra, oh, beautiful beach. It's so much fun to live there. Oh, Carlo, I jealous you. It's so, ah, this and that. You know, there's this othering. There's this othering that is simultaneously attractive and repulsive at the same time. And this is, you know, this, this is, this is colonial through and through, colonial, colonial vocabulary through, through and through. Yeah. And thanks for that, Nicole. Any more questions? I have Doris here with the hand up. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I quite enjoyed the, your uh, your talk, and my interest uh, comes from a very different uh, uh, place. And um, I, my ideas may not be very organized yet, so uh, forgive me if uh, it doesn't make a, a lot of sense, or if there are some uh, some holes. Uh, I'm interested in um, Saint Mary and Prince, which is um, uh, on the West African coast of uh, the coast of Gabon and uh, Equatorial Guinea. And those two islands, um, the archipelago, it's only two islands, it's only me and Prince, and they were quite fundamental on the, the construction of the Atlantic world, the, particularly with this kind of uh, connections that you were talking about, the long distance connections that had more to do with the plantation system and with slavery. However, today, and in most of the history after the, the, the 16th and 17th century, the islands were extremely isolated. And so, the, the kinds of connections that you see uh, in, the, in your case study and in the Caribbean does not necessarily exist in other areas. And I think that for me, it seems to me, it seems that geography plays a big role. While in the case that you were describing, people can actually see the next island 
and they can even if and they can more easily travel. The case of Saint Tome, Saint Tome, the island which is the biggest island, uh, it's 300 kilometers from uh, from Gabon and it's 150 kilometers from uh, from Prince. That's the the next island and another island that now uh, belongs to Equatorial Guinea and Bon. Uh, it's it's also 19, 90 kilometers or something mm -hmm. like that. So the distance it's much larger. And so my question or my my comment it is how much actually geography plays yeah. on this construction of uh, of these transition in insular uh, movements and the, and this vision. Well, um, I, I I don't want to comment on 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 your field site because I'm not familiar with it. But I what what's coming to mind. To, to say is um, this, this, this. So I context, the, 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 the book is, is part of a series. Here we go. Uh, is, is, part, is the third book in a series that's called Rethinking the Island. Rethinking the Island. And mine is the third book. There's two others before, and this is, I think there's more that, that, that came after. This series is, uh, it, the editors of this, of this series, I'll put the names there, because specifically, I want to, maybe you want to look at this one. Godfrey Valdaquino, you wanna scholar Google that. And Elaine Stratford. These two scholars, um, they are, a, I associate, they are part of a, a group of scholars that are developing the theme of island studies. And okay. right? there's an island studies journal, open access, you can look it up. And, and so I, they were the editors of the series, they were the editors of the book. And, and a lot of the, like the, the, the big, in fact, the big question that the book asks is what is an island? That's, that's kind of like the big, you know, the overarching question and whatever is this the, 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 the case study. And my the, the the discussion is contextualized within the emerging field of island studies. Okay, the island studies, <clears throat> the field of island studies, the the ones that at least the, the authors that I reference the most, that I that I that I enjoy, that I find convincing, that work for me. Um, the 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 argument is that um, islands like the sea. So, sorry, the sea, we begin with the sea, sorry. The, the sea simultaneously isolates and connects. Yep. The Atlantic, and now, and now I'm talking about Paul Gilroy, Black Atlantic, Marcus Redeker, Red Atl Atlantic history. So the sea simultaneously binds and, 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 and isolates, binds and at the same time. And it's not schizophrenic, this is a positive creative a, a relationship. Um, so if you think of the sea like that, then the island is simultaneously closed and open. The beach is the beginning, but it's also the end, right? It's, it's, it's right that everything, everything that's in an island came from someplace else, everything. Everything got there, either flew or went there by, by, by sea, right? So, the, 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 the authors that I, that I reference use that as a premise, use this core philosophical principle, they say, as a, as, and, they, and they, they branch out from, from, from there. The idea is to avoid narratives that, that victimize yeah. or romanticize islands. The idea is to, to not fall into that trap. The Malinowski, you know, romanticizing Polynesian, I <laughs> Margaret Mead, someone to avoid this romanticization or the, to avoid this, the, the, yeah, that's, that, yeah, Doris, that's what came to mind. Mm. Sorry, oh, I have, I'm still uh, on. Uh, because what, uh, and this is really thinking aloud, um, what comes to my mind, yes, it is this kind of connection, but the connections that I can find, at least historically, they were forced connections. Yeah. that actually influenced a lot the Caribbean and Brazil and so on coming from such a small place. Mm -hmm. And, but after the, the, the 17th century and the 18th century, the islands were much more isolated. And 
I think also the, the geography of the island itself uh, kind of uh, works in, in, in these, in these, also in terms of like the isolation of some populations, mm -hmm. because this island, for example, Santo Me, it's extremely um, elevated in the in the middle, and that's where you had like the maroon communities, for example, mm -hmm. because for two hundred years no one went there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so so there is like you were saying there is a, this kind of connection, but the I think that the distance that the island has in relation to whatever it's around. Uh, made it in more recent times to be uh, much yeah. more isolated and mm -hmm. connected through capitalist systems mainly. Sure, sure. Yeah, we can, yep. yeah, thanks for a, what can, I think that for me, what I, what I, what I work on is um, where to put the emphasis on. Yeah. So my predecessor who wrote about coastal gentrification and, and, and the destruction of Culebra identity and you know, victimizing, victimizing the island. That text is an emphasis on, on isolation, for good or bad, okay. it's an emphasis on isolation. So, so when I went there as a student, I say, I'm gonna oppose all this, I'm gonna do emphasis on mobility. I'm gonna do emphasis on connection and chaos and that's the way to go. But the ethnograph, the fieldwork was saying something else. The fieldwork was saying, no, this is proud. We're here. We live in a lonely rock. You know, this, this narrative. So, so my intention is to, is to put these two things at the same time. Thank you. Or the relationship between, between the, the relationship between the two. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Daria? Hi, hello. Uh, first of all, Thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. Uh, there's actually, I mean, uh, most of it that I haven't ever heard. So this is, uh, but I find it fascinating. So the question that I have is um, this uh, trans -in insularism uh, of the Car uh, Caribbean islands, uh, Carlo, um, you as um, you know about this, um, where else in the world have you seen, if you may call it as a phenomena or something like that, where else in the world have you seen it uh, as it is in uh, Caribbean islands? So, uh, a, a, a critique that I receive, I have received and, and I, keep, I, keep, I get it every, every now and then, is that, is that the argument is banal. <laughs> that, is, and this, this comes from the uh, scholars who study Polynesia and the Pacific Islands. Um, these, are, these are also islands of intense activity and mobility through them. Um, the origin of modern anthropology, Argonauts of the Western Pacific, the Mayanovsky uh, book, is precisely about uh, islanders getting in canoes and traveling around in order to, to trade with, 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 with other islands. So that's one thing to, to you know, Polynesia, you know, a, the, the Pacific. Um, that's something that, that is, uh, I think the thing is that they don't, it's not emphasized. It's just taken for granted in the Pacific context. I mean, Giovanni left, so I, can, I cannot, I, nobody can help me out with this. But um, my, my sense is that in, a, in, a, in, the, in the Pacific ethnography, the Polynesia, Melanesia ethnography, the idea that the islands are somehow interlinked and connected is, is taken for granted, is not seen as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a topic. Mm -hmm. um, transinsularism, it's funny, I was having a conversation earlier with a, one of our graduate students and um, he, was, he asked something like, what, what applications does it, does it have, right? What does applications work? How can, it, how can transinsularism apply in other fields of, of, of discussion? And this is a bit, uncooked, but I, I, perhaps it's because I overthink the, the, the concept, but I suggest that where I am now is that transinsularism is not only about describing the history of an island or the political process that islanders go through. So maybe it has implications to talk about like existentialism. Hold yeah, on. exactly. Right. Okay, good. I'm not going. Yeah, I, okay, I thought I was being a bit. Okay. No, this is actually the yeah. first thing that I see how it affects mm. your mind and how you see yourself and the applications where it comes, like, yeah, how it affects other parts of 
your life and connections. Yeah. So, so this is not in the book, but if I get to do another edition, I'll probably add it in the conclusion. So uh, I'm a, I read a lot the cosmopolitan anthropology, uh, uh, cosmopolitanism, and there's a, there's a theme there that, that, that the, the self, the, the subject, the, you, you, you are not made of yourself. You are made up of relationships, mm -hmm. right? You are made up, you are a daughter, you are a mother, you are this, you're a woman, man. All these are relational uh, identities that you contend and conform, you, uh, conform, conform with. So, how, so you know, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm a man, I'm heterosexual most of the time, I think, this and that, right? But, um, but these do not necessarily define me. I'm still Carlo. I still don't lose my sense of self. So I'm, I'm, I'm made up of others, but I'm made up, I'm, I get lost there. But yeah, I think that is, yeah, that's, and I'm not very confident because it's uncooked, but uh, I like to think that trans transinsularism has, uh, it's a, it's a, if you take it as a metaphor, it, 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 it may have philosophical implications. Where you talk about identity in general, you know, what is, what is a Latvian? What is a Lithuanian? You know, Lithuanian, you know, Lithuanian history is, the border has been moving up and down, this and that. You know, so it's, a, it's, it's, and it's open to the world, and, 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 but at the same, a very strong sense of self. Sorry, I'm rambling, but that's, that's, what, I, that's what came to mind, Maria. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Okay, I think uh, we'll give Carlos a break and uh, a, a well-deserved round of applause. <laughs> Carlos, okay, and well. thank you so much for that thought-provoking talk. Thank you. Maybe we can do it next week again. <laughs> yeah, next week we can talk about something else. Yeah, sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, uh, yeah. So thank you very much all for coming yeah. and uh, just a, a, a little um, a, a statement. We're going to have a schedule of talks through the year. So we're going to have one every month. And if you want to find out about the schedule, please go to the website that I think was posted, but it's, um, let me type it here if I can uh, chat. Uh, uh, to everyone, um, sassycon21.fsflt. Is that right, Christina? Can you see that? I shared it as well. Okay, there you go. So we will have a schedule up. I think we're going to have our next one will be at the later this month and will be on education and anthropology two anthropologists one uh, both of them from scandinavia one from uh, um, finland and the other one from uh, who's working now in germany uh, from um, norway so perhaps uh, you can look at that one we're going to have another one later on uh, with a by the way carlo before you go from the University of Manchester, Alexandria Donofri, who is going to be talking about theater and anthropology, which I think you might find quite interesting. Anyway, thanks a lot. And uh, that's the end. <laughs> have, have a deserved drink and see you later. Gotcha. Till next time. Bye, guys. Till next time. Bye. Thank you very much.